Am I on? There you go. It's been uh, somewhat interesting to me over the years to, in my near 70 years, 68 years, to just kind of observe things that have happened in churches where I've been or places where I've visited, places I've known about, Christian for a long time now. And uh doesn't make me an authority on anything. In fact, if you learn anything as you get older, you get dumber. You kind of come to the realization that you not only don't know anything, you don't know very much at all. You don't know everything. You don't know very much at all. Let me say that right. Well, when you look at the church over time, there are things that probably disturb a great many of us. But the truth of the matter is, we've had our struggles over the years trying to stay together and have peace and unity. We are fortunate here that you have good elders here preaching, deacons, congregation of people who love one another, but it's not always that way in places, been in places. And if you have been at places where division has occurred and strife and discord, and become a part of a congregation, you know how sad and tragic it is. The hard on us, those of us who have been around for a while. The longer we're in the faith, the more we appreciate the peace that passeth all understanding. Paul didn't condemn division for any other reason than the fact that God hates it. He doesn't like for us to be divided. And as you, you look at the church and our individual participation, and even as we would go to Acts 2, to look at the, the church being instituted and Peter preaching that great sermon there. And after he preaches the sermon and he asks that question, important question, and the answer is given to repent and be baptized. We see the church, really the first church, being organized. They'll be dispersing over in chapter 8 and verse 4. And when they do, they take the word of God with them. And what's changed people is the cross. People then and people now are willing to change their lives because they come to an understanding of the sacrifice made by the Son of God. Realize, even as those did in Acts 2, and when Peter preached to them and said, you killed Jesus, this man approved of God, you did it. And it caused them as they looked upon themselves to reflect on decisions that were made. We might say on behaviors. Now behavior, someone's behavior, that very, the definition of that term indicates a deliberate response of, indivi of an individual. We don't change Typically, accidentally. We change our behavior because we want to. We determine to do that. Those in Acts 2, once they heard and received the word of God and became Christians, it impacted them. The cross did that to them. It changed them. And it was personal. And they were glad because of the things that were going on. And they were steadfast in their daily work. And we could read all about that in Acts 2, verses 41 through 47. Had all things common. And there was association and there was brotherhood and there was closeness and fellowship like never before. And it makes me wonder then, when you read about the churches, particularly those that Paul wrote to, and specifically the church at Ephesus. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, in verse 23, verse 24, those two verses, Peace be to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at 24. Grace be with all who love our Lord Jesus with love incorruptible. Paul is commending the church at Ephesus for loving the Lord Jesus Christ with love incorruptible. Solid love. Faithful love. Love for the Lord. Love for the cross. Appreciation for the importance and the relevance of the church being organized and us being a family and in loving and exhorting and provoking one another 
to love and good works and all that goes with that. All right, now that we've read that, I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 1 and see what happens a generation later. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. Now notice. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. One generation. This church went from a church that was known and had the reputation for having an incorruptible love for Christ. And we now read about them having left their first love. As King James would say. Now that's, that should be a, a warning to us. That just because we're right today and we're peaceful today and we have things going on as it relates to the work of the church here, and that's all good. I'm not trying in any way to discourage anybody this evening, just to simply point out that it doesn't take long for us to find ourselves in deep trouble with the Lord. There's five of the seven churches that are spoken of negatively by John through inspiration, chapters 2 and 3. Only two churches. And Ephesus surely wasn't one of them, although there were some good things said about them. The point of all that, we could spend a lot of time talking about Smyrna and Philadelphia and the characteristics of those two good churches, or any of those negative terms that are used as it relates to the five churches. And we might make some reference to them later, but my point now is simply just to say that we need to be on guard all the time to make sure that we're doing things that please God and that we're behaving ourselves. Remember when I used that word earlier tonight? That we're deliberately responding as God would have us to do. And when you have people who understand their, their individual responsibility to behave themselves individually, you will then find a church that behaves itself responsibly. And it's individuals that cause the church not to be what it ought to be. It doesn't happen just suddenly, usually, either. Now, what I want us to think about as we think about the subject matter of changes in the church, and the reason why I preach this nearly everywhere I go, in fact, I don't know of a place where I've been for more than one time that I didn't preach the sermon, is because I think the, the, the process that goes on that can lead us to division is one that you can almost see happen time and time after again. We might call it an evolutionary process. Not always is that word evolution a negative word. It just means change. That's why I call this sermon the changes in the church. Now, you're going to be aware of this, and you're going to see it even in the church in Acts chapter 2. The first stage, and we don't not need PowerPoint for this. There's four points, and you're going to get them, I think, pretty well if I do my job. The first stage is the beginning stage. That's what we have in Acts 2. We have a church that's beginning to build itself based on their response as individuals to the gospel call, that which Peter preached, and having heard that and responding to it, then those, the 3,000 that were baptized into Christ, perhaps more later, then became the church in that area, and they began working in common, even willing to sell all that they had in the distribution of trying to help and encourage those of like precious faith. That's good behavior. When we began years ago, for those of you that are aware of the church in Bentonville, Arkansas, that church began in the kitchen of my house. No longer exists. Not there anymore. Now, I'm not here to, to speak badly about any of the preachers or any of the people that were there just to make a statement. Then in 1994 or so, in the house, in our house, in the kitchen, five families sat down, made a financial determination, made a commitment 
mentally and spiritually to the Lord and to one another, wrote checks, did what we had to do to purchase property, purchased the property with a little old house on it, knocked out the walls, did whatever we had to do to get that building in place where we could meet, and not the first, but the second Sunday as a church that we met, we met in that little building, and we owned our own property. But much, but it was ours. Now, can you imagine the excitement? If you've ever been through that, you know exactly what I'm talking about, that one has when he's a part of something new like that. When you see, actually, the dispor- dispersion in Acts 8, verse 4, in a real way happening, and you're involved and engaged in it, and you have people who are sitting together, and you're, in, you're working together, you're, it's exciting. There's enthusiasm, and that's the way it is, much like it is for, for somebody who becomes a part of a new government in high school or something, and they're part of that. They, they want to build something from new, or a new marriage. And you have a husband and wife who are excited before they get married, dreaming big and having all, that's all good. It, it needs to happen, and we should feel that way. A new partnership, we're hanging a new shingle. And there's excitement about the new idea and the new business. We've all been through these sorts of things, and they're good things, and they're, they're necessary. And we see the example of the Jerusalem church and the enthusiasm and activity that they have and this idea, this, this churning and this energy of two or more poured into one effort to build something new, and there's a lot of smiling going on, a lot of encouragement from one another. John 2 and verse 17, as Jesus quotes from Psalm 69 and verse 9, or the John the Baptist, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up, the passage says. And we need that kind of zeal and that in our own lives, and there is that kind of zeal, and there was that kind of zeal in Bentonville as we were building that thing that was new. And like Nehemiah's group who had returned from captivity to rebuild the walls, we have a mind to work in that situation. And I mean, I don't know how it was and how it is with you when you build something new and you start a new work or you're a part of something, but people show up in masses and are doing for one another and construction's being done and we're all getting a hammer and we're all doing our part just like it was during the building of the walls at Nehemiah's day. The prayers are constant and continual even as Nehemiah prayed for four months before he went to go build the walls and before the king gave him permission to do that. And you're hearing people praying about the growth of the congregation and having the will to work and the spirit and the energy to convert and do all the things that need to be done for a new work that it might be successful. And a real responsibility comes with that. The beginning stage or the creating stage. Number two, there's the organizing stage. And it's necessary. And what's easy for us is that the Lord doesn't make it difficult or challenging for us to understand the organization and one simple passage is all that needs to be read to emphasize that Philippians uh, chapter 1 and verse 1 Paul and Timothy servants of Christ Jesus there's Paul and Timothy the preachers by the way the servants of Christ Jesus to all the saints there's you and me in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi that's the local congregation with the overseers and the deacons there it is There's the organization, not complex, not difficult. And so this new church, this new congregation, one just like in Acts 2, and the scriptures tell us that, that they found the churches wanting, and that Paul and Barnabas appointed elders. And we see elders being appointed in this new congregation and deacons being put in. And teachers are being established, and we're growing the congregation, and everybody's still happy and smiling as we watch the work of the Lord being done, as the elders are feeding the clock, and the deacons are seeing to the physical needs of the congregation as Scripture records. And as Paul says in in, in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 10, that these first be proved, these deacons doing their work as the elders oversee in Acts 20 and verse 28, 1 Peter chapter 5. A lot of time could be spent about that, but You have elders here. You have deacons here. You have a preacher here. 
you have organization. I saw it, and you've seen it. It was evidenced by the way the announcements were, were done. It was evidenced by the way Scripture was read. It was evidenced by the way prayers occurred and happened, by the way songs were sang. And everybody was worshiping God, and there wasn't any, any, any problems or challenges with us doing that and understanding our roles and our responsibilities. We're doing that which God has told us to do. And we're doing it because the organization is occurring and happening just the way God intended for it to happen. It's the pattern that God has designed. And it's during this period of time, perhaps, that we're building our building. You know, we, we, we have to do that. We start process early on in the beginning of the congregation is the congregation first with its people, the church being ecclesia involving people. And then the walls got to go up. So we get together and we start in our organization finding a place to worship at the church at Bentonville. We it wasn't long after we got there that we outgrew that old house. And, and we ended up knocking the house down and temporarily meeting in another place. And we built a building there. Because that's what you do in order to get yourself in a situation where the church can grow in a given or local area. And we begin to organize ourselves the way we're supposed to. Eventually we... We appointed elders, and we had deacons, and we hired a preacher, all part of the organization. And we see that, don't we, happening in churches around about. It's a necessary stage. Not only one that God approves, but one he encouraged. And through inspiration, we can understand how we ought to do it. But listen to me. Then comes the third stage. We, we've had that excitement for enthusiasm from the beginning of the church and we've started the church and now we've organized it and, and we have our classes and we have our building and we have our preacher, we have our elders, we have our deacons and now we kind of just sit and say, okay, we've arrived. And the conversion stops. And no longer do we have the behavioral pattern or passion to go out and save souls like that. We hire somebody to do that by proxy. We ask it be done, the going into all the world and preaching the gospel be done by the person we hire. And he assumes the role the best that he can, but individuals in the congregation who once were on fire and once enthused and encouraged now just set. mean this in any way to, to be negative about congregations of people. I just think it happens. That as churches continue to grow and elders are doing their jobs and overseeing and preachers are preaching and deacons are serving, the rest of us just find it very easy to lean back and let them do the work. So our success makes us complacent. And like the church that Laodicea, we become maybe lukewarm and apathetic, indifferent, happy for someone else to do the work. We're now too busy. We're busy with our kids' softball or baseball. Too busy to be here. And Now, when we started back here at the beginning, we would have done anything to be at the building to help the church because I was needed during that time, and I'm enthusiastic during that time, but now we have others to do that. So we go to the baseball games. Nothing wrong with baseball. I like baseball, especially Razorback baseball. Or we go to the golf course. Or we go fishing. Not, well, I'm not picking on you. You know, we go find something else to do that we may not have done because of the enthusiasm and the excitement that we had and the call to be used back here, but now we're so large... Or we become big enough that we just let the elders and the deacons and the preacher do that. And we don't assume our individual responsibility to do the work that God has called us to do. And he has called us to do it. I mean, the most important thing you and I can do is save somebody else's soul. There's not anything more important for us to do, either through your own children or somebody else's children or brother or sister, nothing more important for us to do than to keep somebody from going to hell to try to save their soul best way I know to keep that requirement of loving the Lord thy God with all of our heart with all of our mind and all of our soul is to love our neighbors as ourselves 
and I want for myself salvation. And we should find a way and have it within us, the spirit and the motivation, the desire to continue no matter what goes on around us to to keep trying to serve others and cause other people and influence other people to be a light unto the world, a salt unto the earth, to cause people to change their life, to behave themselves differently, to become children of God. But we find ourselves oftentimes in many churches fall into the trap of getting apathetic and indifferent because maybe the growth has happened so rapidly. And some who have been very good workers all of a sudden just put themselves out to pasture. Not a good thing for us to do that. Not good for the church, and certainly we're not behaving ourselves the way that the Lord would want us to. And listen to me, it's the very thing that God condemned Ephesus for doing. You know, when you look at that particular phrase about their love going away, you know, it's the idea of, of slipping And the Hebrew writer talks and warns about us in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1 about drifting or slipping. And and the idea is that it's not necessarily that we intended to grow cold, but because our behavior has begun to change and our minds are, are different and our thinking process is different that we suddenly just find ourselves slipping. I think that's exactly what happened to the church at Ephesus, and they left the first love. I love Ezekiel 33 and verse 30 through 33. I think it explains the very thing I'm trying to talk about here and say in this defending state. This is where we, we, are, where we are. Ezekiel 33 and verse 30. As for you, son of man, your people who walk together about you by the walls and at the doors of the houses say to one another, each to his brother, Come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come. And they sit before you as my people. And they hear what you say, but they will not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. And behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, for they hear what you say, but they will not do it. People, when we get to a point where we become comfortable, we should look at ourselves in the mirror and we should not look away from it. We should examine ourselves carefully. It'll be like that man in James chapter 1 is. Beholdeth what manner of man that is. He looks in the glass and then forgets what manner of man that is. That's not who you want to be. You want to see yourself for the way you are, warts and all. And when you see yourself and you're in a situation where you're not doing the work you need to be doing to help the family, the church where you attend, the way it needs to be helped because of a personal obligation to behave yourself the way a Christian ought to, the way they did in Acts chapter 2, if you're not doing that, start doing that. That's really the encouragement here. Don't be apathetic. Don't leave your first love. Don't slip. Get a hold of yourself. That's what the idea of self-control is. It comes from a Greek word that means putting your arms around each other, getting control of yourself. Get a hold of yourself and try to change your attitude and your perspective. Start making all... uh, decisions where you do honor six, Matthew 6 and verse 33, where you are seeking first the kingdom of God, where you are setting your mind on things above. And those decisions, when you first became a Christian, generally speaking, when we have an individual, at least in my experience, particularly with young people who come up out of the water, they're on fire. And they, there's a sense about them of behavior and of change that we all ought to have. Far too many of us old people put the fire out and shame on us. But there needs to be in us that spirit that changed us. The cross that Jesus died on. The behavior tendencies that change with somebody who's obedient to the cross. The individual who understands what Romans 12, 1 and 2 say. And that we're, we're, we're people who are not conformed to this world. But we're transformed by what? By the renewing of our minds. Because our mind is set on things above. 
and we're seeking first the kingdom of God. And that's who we were and what we were whenever the church first started that we were a part of if you begin to help build one. It was like that at Bentonville. Here's the point. Point number four, the dividing stage. I've seen this, and Bentonville's one of them. No longer there. When we left there, that congregation, after we had started that work together, sometime in the late 90s, there were well over 100 members there. What happened? Why is it no longer there? I, I, I'm pretty sure I know the reason why. Because somewhere along the way, we forgot to be who we were in Acts chapter 2. And the organizing stage, as essential it was, soon slipped into the defending stage. And when we got there, because now we have our building, we have our classroom, we have teachers who teach our children, we're able to drop them off, leave them, let them do the teaching. It becomes very easy for us to come lackadaisical. And my warning is to you, let's not let that kind of thing happen. It is in during this stage that a once happy body of common believers are now in dissent. And things of the world begin to creep in. I've seen this happen before very long. We have Diotrephes who enter. And anybody who knows about Diotrephes knows he loved to have preeminence among them. People wanting their own way. People who are no longer submitting to elders. People who are allowing things to be preached in the pulpit and submitting and agreeing to things that, that are not consistent with Scripture. Just whatever. No longer a concern or attitude of being like those Bereans who are more noble than those in Thessalonica because they search the Scripture daily. No longer are we that kind of people, more than willing to let somebody throw something up on a PowerPoint slide and just preach a sermon, let's go home and eat roast. And that's when we're in trouble as a congregation whenever we get to that point. Our growth stagnates. As Ephesus, we leave our first love. We don't give each other the benefit of the fit of the doubt anymore. We become consumed with our own selves, and in the doing of that, we want our own way, and we squabble amongst ourselves oftentimes. And such things as marriage infidelity and social drinking and dancing in a modest dress and such like raise their, their heads, and people get mad, and the church divides, and we just wink at all that stuff that's going on. We're not interested so much anymore in trying to get involved in fixing things that might be challenging to us and we just let it go. The church that once we began to involve with and we were enthusiastic support is no longer the church that it once was. Five churches of Asia had come to this. Paul in the Philippian letter, chapter 1 and verse 27, talks about the idea of of unity and being one congregation together Philippians 1 27 only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ so whether I come and see you or am absent I may hear of you that you are standing firm in one spirit with one mind striving side by side in the faith of the gospel so where are we it's really the question it's where's the church the highway 65 church to Christ in Conway. I, I know you got good elders. I know you got a good preacher. I know all that. I'm sure you got good deacon. Don't know all of you real well. Know some of you. Good people here. But I'm telling you, if we find ourselves slipping, there's only one thing for us to do. Go back to the enthusiastic stage and go back to Acts 2 and look at the people. Look at yourself as one of those people. And what converted you? And go be that person again. Don't let yourself get to stage three. Don't get apathetic. Don't get defensive. Don't find yourself in that stage. Let it be a warning to you. Because the next stage after that is you'll become less than what you need to be. You'll become like Ephesus, if you're not careful. And you will leave your first love, if not individually, collectively. And so I'm encouraging you to Keep an eye on yourself to understand that it's not just these elders' responsibility. It is their job to overlook the flock here. It certainly is. But you contribute so much to the effectiveness of this congregation by your individual behavior and your participation. 
And it won't be what it ought to be at Highway 65 Church of Christ unless you understand that you need to be one of those people, just like in Acts 2, who understood the importance of behaving themselves. And they worked, didn't they? They were steadfast, and that's who they were. And in Acts chapter 8, when they dispersed, they took the gospel with them. And that's what happens with people who are effectively serving God and have assumed and accepted Christ for who he is. That's the lesson. If you're not a Christian, if we can help you in any way, we want to do that tonight. We'd love to baptize you into Christ. If you are a Christian and you've not been what you ought to be, and I would say this to you. If you're not serving God today the way you ought to, you're affecting the church here. But you're not going to go to heaven like that. And that's what concerns me the most. If you, if you miss heaven in the words of old brother Bowman, you've missed it all. There isn't anything and never will be anything like the heaven that I read about in the scriptures. And you we don't think about that enough and we don't vision it enough. We don't take pictures of it enough. We don't see ourselves in heaven as we ought to. We don't see ourselves sitting around the throne of God with the likes of Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and Ruth. We don't see ourselves there asking questions of the Apostle Paul. We don't see the, the, the sea that will no longer separate us from the throne of God. We don't see ourselves singing praises forever to God. And because of that, we lose our enthusiasm and we become indifferent. And the church not only is not what it's going to be, we possibly and potentially are going to miss heaven. Don't let that happen. If you've been wrong with the Lord, and you have not served God the way you ought to, you come forward tonight and ask for the prayers of the church. Ask these elders to work with you to make you and use you the way that you need to be used to effectively serve God. If we have people behaving themselves like that, the church will grow, and it will be what God wants us to be. Won't you come as we stand and sing the invitation song?